Thank you, Mike. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, clearly, this is a difficult uh, uh, role to fill after this wonderful talk about the nature of some very massive and very large things. We are going to change our attention to things which are considerably smaller. Uh, I will talk about X-ray micros microscopy and have to ask the question, why do we bother? Uh, clearly, microscopes are here to visualize things very small, and uh, in conventional microscopy using visible light, uh, the resolution tends to be limited by the wavelengths to something like a micron or a fraction of a micron, and so there has been a desire to go to shorter wavelengths to do that, and of course, uh, the first candidate along these lines has been <coughs> electron microscopes, and electron microscopes have revealed uh, uh, the structure of matter at a very fine scale. Today, there are electron microscopes that can see individual atoms, but there are limitations in electron microscopy in that the sample that you have to uh, prepare must be quite thin, and furthermore, in many cases, the contrast is quite limited. X-rays, on the other hand, also uh, offer short wavelengths, and they are considerably more penetrating. And furthermore, X-ray spectra provide uh, good contrast, which is shown on this transparency. And you can see two vertical lines. One of them is the carbon, the other one is the oxygen K absorption edge. And in between, there is a very large difference between the absorptivity of uh, organic matter and water. So for instance, if your model of a biological cell is sort of like a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup, you will be able to, in this area, see the bits of chicken and noodle in a relatively transparent broth. Uh, now, uh, to spend a moment on the history of X-ray microscopy, it all started with Röntgen's absolutely remarkable paper which announced his discovery and where he already tells the community that lenses and mirrors unfortunately don't work. Well, the first breakthrough along these lines is in a somewhat obscure paper by Albert Einstein where he points out that uh, according to theory, the index of refraction of, uh, 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 for X-rays in materials should be slightly less than one that should make it possible to have total external reflection at grazing incidence. And this is a reproduction, a poor reproduction of Einstein's uh, little paper, and uh, he makes a correct estimate of the index of refraction decrement and points about, talks about total external reflection. Uh, the next major step uh, took quite a bit longer to take, and it also took place on the Stanford campus where Paul Kirkpatrick was interested in actually building grazing incidence optics for X-rays. And uh, he wrote an article in the Scientific American in uh, March of 1949, and the uh, title page in the Scientific American uh, uh, says that the X-ray microscope would be a big improvement on microscopes using light or electrons for X-rays combined short wavelengths giving fine resolution and penetration. The main problem standing in the way has now been solved. Well, uh, the image in the, the article itself is that of the kirkpatrick Baez mirror pair where each of these grazing incidence mirrors does the focusing in one of the two dimensions. And indeed, this arrangement is now in widespread use for creating microprobes of X-rays because it works perfectly well for up points on the optic axis. Unfortunately, Kirkpatrick didn't realize that for points off the axis, the aberrations are absolutely awful. So as an image forming system, this doesn't work. However, zone plates, which are diffractive optical elements, had been known for many years 
and it was Kirkpatrick's uh, frustrated uh, young colleague, Albert Baez, who was among the first to suggest that uh, zone plates be used for focusing X-rays. In the first diffraction order, uh, you can get a resolution which you can easily show is just 1.22 times the finest outermost ring that you can deposit as part of the zone plate. This is quite a technological challenge because not only do you have to make these rings very narrow, but you have to place them with an accuracy which is one-third the width of this zone, so typically the accuracy that you require is on the order of one part in 10 to the fourth. So the history of the making of the zone plates is one where uh, progress was very rapid between the 1950s and the 1970s. Uh, after uh, Baez's attempts, uh, notably Günther Schmal's group in Göttingen developed the holographic technique of build, making these microscopes, and he was the first one to break the one micron resolution barrier. And uh, his group was also the first one to operate an X-ray microscope at a synchrotron light source, and this is from their 1976 paper, which shows all the main ingredients of one of these full-field microscopes, where you use two zone plates, one of them as a substage condenser and the other one as the magnifying objective in order to uh, create a magnified real image, which is an exact analog of an ordinary visible light microscope. Uh, the, uh, in the uh, 1990s, the Center for X-ray Optics at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory got involved in fabricating zone plates by electron beam microfabrication, and Eric Anderson and his colleagues uh, in the early part of this decade has already made zone plates with the finest line widths of 25 nanometers, which is quite a remarkable achievement. And these zone plates have really uh, set the uh, standard of uh, X-ray microscopy for the last uh, several years, and they are in widespread use throughout the uh, community. Now, an alternative arrangement for microscopes to the one that I showed that uh, Günther Schmal and company developed is the scanning microscope that is close to my heart, where what you do is you take a small source of X-rays and you use uh, one of these zone plates in order to form a nanoprobe, a, a very tiny focused spot, and then you just mechanically scan the sample with that uh, probe, and you detect uh, the transmitted X-rays, or if you care, you can uh, detect X-ray fluorescence or photoelectrons or, the, or other types of uh, 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 phenomena. Uh, in the case of the scanning microscope, you collect the image pixel by pixel, so it goes considerably sm slower than the other type, but uh, the size of the microprobe here determines the resolution entirely, and so uh, by setting the scan parameters, you can have an arbitrary uh, object area, and uh, you can display things at arbitrary magnification. What really counts, of course, is uh, uh, the size of the microprobe, and furthermore, in order to be able to collect the information relatively rapidly, you need a very bright source in order to illuminate the microscope. 